Welcome to Business Authority Radio, bringing you insights from today's thought leaders, professionals, and influencers with your hosts, Neil Howe and Craig Williams. Hello and welcome to the show. This is your host, Neil Howe, and today our guest is Dave Zook. Uh, Dave has been an investor and entrepreneur all his adult life. His investments cover a myriad of real estate holdings, including real estate uh, in several states in the United States, multifamily apartments, and ATM portfolios. Additionally, Dave has international real estate investment holdings in Panama, Canada, and Belize, and he and his investors own 3,000 plus apartment units, mostly in Memphis and Texas. Uh, Welcome to the show, Dave. Hey, Neil, thanks for having me on your show. Well, that is uh, quite a portfolio that you have there. Tell me a little bit about your background and how you got started in investing. Well, it's been fun. I, I got to tell you, I, I've been an investor for about as long as I can remember. Um, it was, I was in my teens when I uh, really got into it and and uh, I, you know, I, I just, uh, I just love business. I got an entrepreneurial family, but uh, I had watched my dad do real estate uh, when I was young and, and he self-managed some of his own real estate. And I just decided right there early that uh, that wasn't something that I was going to be a part of and, and really made up my mind that I wasn't going to invest in real estate at all. And, uh so I invested in businesses and I built a couple businesses and really got to the point where it got to stabilize and very profitable. And, and uh, after uh, doing that for a number of years and, and really I had a business that really didn't have any depreciation or tax uh, benefits or tax shelter um, involved in it. Uh, it was a sales and marketing company and we were selling uh, products all over the United States and, and even out of the country internationally. And uh, so I got to the point where I was making a lot of money, but at the end of the day, uh, I was given almost half of it back to the government. And uh, I was always taught from a young age that if you make a lot of money, you got to pay a lot of tax. And uh, it was through educating myself and, and reading a lot and following a lot of uh, a lot of real, uh, and following a lot of Robert Kiyosaki's writings and teachings that I was able to figure out that uh, you know real estate might be a way that I can give myself a, a little tax shelter. So I really got chased into real estate because of the tax problem. Mm. Hello and welcome to the show. This is your host, Neil Howe, and today's guest is Dave Zook. Uh, Dave has been an investor and entrepreneur all of his adult life. His investments cover a myriad of real asset holdings, including real estate in several states in the United States, uh, multifamily apartments, and ATM portfolios. Additionally, Dave has international real estate investment holdings in Panama, Canada, and Belize. Wow. Welcome to the show, Dave. Hey, Neil. Thanks for having me on your show. Well, that's uh, quite a bit of experience, uh, especially that international uh, real estate and holdings, which is awesome. Really want to hear about that. But why don't you share with us uh, how you got started in real estate uh, and investing in all these different asset classes? You know, I come from a, a strong entrepreneurial family. So I was an entrepreneur and an investor uh, most of my life. And I, as a teenager, I started investing. I actually watch my dad I was, as I was growing up. He invested in real estate. He self-managed some of his real estate. And I, I saw uh, that that wasn't something that I was going to want to be involved in. So I, I specifically decided that I wasn't going to invest in real estate and instead focused a lot more on business. So I started a couple of businesses. I founded a couple. I bought a couple. I, I, I really was all business mode. And I uh, got to the point where some of those businesses started doing really well. And it was, I also always believed the myth that if you make a lot of money, you got to pay a lot of tax. Well, got to the point where some of those businesses were doing really well and I started paying a lot of tax. And I remember clearly the day that I got the call on April the 13th saying that I had to come up with a couple hundred thousand dollars yet 
in the next two days. And, uh, you know, that was after making my quarterly tax payments. And so I, I did a deep dive and really uh, listened and read a lot of Robert Kiyosaki's uh, teachings and got to the point where I realized that real estate might be a good uh, tax uh, shelter or tax play for me. And, and so I really educated myself and, and all of a sudden I got to the point where I didn't only know that I needed it, but I wanted a lot of it. And uh, so I kind of started my path down the real estate investor um, side and uh, it's just been a lot of fun. I, I was an investor myself uh, for my own uh, uh, portfolio and then got to the point where I had bought a couple hundred units on my own and uh, at some point, you always run out of your own money. So uh, there were still good deals out there. This was a few years ago. There were still good deals out there in the multifamily space. And at that point, I reached out and started inviting my family and friends and uh, started doing syndicating and, and putting deals together for people. So I've been doing a lot of that in the last couple of years. Well, that's certainly uh, some experience to have to come up with a couple of hundred thousand dollars <laughs> in a couple of days. I'm sure that's a wake-up call that, uh, you know, like you said, got you to think outside the box and do something different. Um, go ahead. Well, yeah, and, you know, looking back now, it, it, it is something that I'll never forget. And but going through that experience and having to do that deep dive and and really uh, figuring out that, you know, if I behave differently, I get taxed differently. You know, Tom Wheelwright from ProVision, he told me that um, if you want to change your tax, you have to change your facts, meaning that if you behave different, you get taxed different. And when I realized that all you really had to do was do what the government wanted you to do and was incentivizing you to do. And if you follow that plan and, and you get smart with that. Now, if I hadn't gone through that, I wouldn't be able to help other investors go through it today. So I guess it was sort of a, uh, yes, it was a blow. And yes, it wasn't a, a fun thing to go through. But in going through that, I'm now able to help other investors, um, you know, work through their tax planning uh, issues and, and really add value to them on that side, not only on the return on investment side, but also on the tax side. So you're the CEO and the founder of the Real Asset Investor. Now, that's not necessarily just real estate assets. Talk to me about some of the other assets that you are involved with. Yeah, so we, I, I have been personally, I've been an ATM investor the cash machines, ATM investor for, well, since 2012. And I was a, a passive investor with this group and I had gotten uh, introduced to these guys by a really good friend and advisor of mine. Um, you know, when you hang around good people and you get advice from good people, you know, good things happen. And I was uh, very fortunate to be introduced to this group. And in, so I'd been investing in ATM for a number of years and and in 2016, they came to me and said, "Hey, uh, you've got a network of investors. Uh, let's, you know, let's see what these guys, let's see what your folks think of ATM investing." And they said, "We'll give you a two million dollar tranche to to rule out to your investors and see if they like it." And uh, so that was the start. I, uh, you know, December 2016, about eight months ago, seven months ago, um, we introduced it to our investors, and since then we've uh, we've uh, gotten about eleven million dollars in ATM machines and uh, have distributed them all over the United States, and they've been just a very lucrative asset class, and it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, explain that a little bit more to me and to the audience. Just how the investment in ATM machines works. Yeah, so I mean, the the, the real simple version is when somebody walks up and swipes their card in a machine. That transaction costs that person anywhere from two dollars to four dollars. Most of the time, it's in that two dollars, two dollars, two fifty, three dollar range. Well, somebody's on the other side of that transaction, and most people think that the banks own ATM machines. It's really not true, for the most part. Those ATM machines are owned by investor groups, private equity funds, and those types of folks, and they're they're taking their cut of that transaction. So really the way it works is there's there's kind of a three-part process. You got the management team, 
you got the investor, and then you got the owner of the real estate. So, you know, that $2.50 transaction gets chopped up three ways, and you as an investor can get a, a really nice, strong double digit return with really good tax benefits as well. And it's a five year depreciation schedule. So, most of your cash flow in those first five years is, is protected and tax free. Well, it definitely sounds like a good uh, investment, uh, one that probably most people will not have thought too much into. So tell me, you've got all this experience now in investing and you've got different kinds of assets going on and you're working with other investors. Tell me what problems uh, other investors have and why they come to you for help. Well, you probably know a lot of these assets have been run up in price and, you know, multifamily, multifamily apartments being one of them. I mean, they were, the, they were one of the hottest asset classes around in the last couple of years. So, you know, that gets to be a problem when you're out there uh, buying or looking for inventory to buy. Um, right now, I mean, we're not going out there on LoopNet and some of the big commercial exchanges. We're, we're leveraging our relationship and, our reputation in the market, mostly Memphis, um, to be able to buy quality assets still. Um, no, it's not as easy as it was a few years ago, but they're still out there. And if you've got a really good team, a really good reputation, you not only can still find good assets, but you can get them for, you know, uh, 5%, 8%, 10% sometimes, less than some of the other buyers at the table. If, you, if you're local, you've got a really good team, and you've got cash, you're at the right place at the right time, you can still get good deals. So it makes sense then to join forces with somebody who has that reputation in the local market? You know, it's, it's so unfair that when somebody says, hey, let's, uh, you know, let's go to another city and find a team and and get into the multifamily space in that city, you know, I, I realize what kind of an advantage I have as a local to the Memphis market, my team's in Memphis. And so I realize what kind of advantage I have in the Memphis market. And I don't want to be the new guy um, going to the, to the buyer's side of the table and fighting with, you know, three other buyers and some of those guys being local. This this is this market is not, you know, the multifamily space and going into a new market, this isn't fair. Um so I, I don't want to be the new guy. And now if I do go to another market, it's typically what I'll do is I'll team up with somebody that already has a, a reputation in that space. So I, I just feel like, you know, it's high in the buying cycle in the multifamily space. And to go in there fresh to a new market, it could be a little tricky at this point in time in the buying cycle. So let's talk about some of the misconceptions about buying into assets such as uh, real estate or such as the multifamily homes. What are some of the misconceptions that people have that maybe stop them from getting involved? So... You know, you're really you're really playing tug of war with Wall Street. Most folks have been programmed to believe that a Wall Street investment is the safe investment. And when you venture out too far outside of that, you know, it's dangerous out there. And so, you know, uh, real estate, um, you know, we've just been through a 2008-2009 crisis. But it also was a crisis that affected Wall Street. But but conventional wisdom still says that Wall Street is the safe, uh, solid investment. And, you know, I, I just, you know, I have this motto and it's on my website. You can see it. You know, you can be conventional or you can be wealthy, but you need to pick one. You know, I just don't think that conventional wisdom uh, is going to get you to where you want to go as far as, uh, you know, you're in your financial life. And I'm, you know, Conventional can be anything as mainstream. If it's mainstream and easy, you probably don't want to be there. Um, you know, I, I just like to be on the side where, you know, I, I just I just don't like to be on the side with the masses. And um, so I, I would say that's a big one. Now, talking about being unconventional, um, you know, people are probably looking for 
a safe bet. Uh, and that's why they go with some of these conventional methods. How do you convince them that the unconventional is the way to go? You know, it's not really that hard when you look back at, you know, just a few years ago, 2008 and 2009, really who was in control there? Well, it wasn't the investor. And do you really want to be in a position where you have no control over your financial future? You know, whatever happens, happens, and you just you just ride along. So, it, you know, you, you really got to lead with education. You know, a lot of people think that, you know, if I just leave my money in there for, you know, if I just leave my money at Wall Street, and you know, over the long term, I'll get, you know, a 7 or 8, 8% return. Well, you know, if you if you throw in all the different factors that will affect that return, like inflation, like fees, like taxes, you know, it really gets to the point where it's a lot smaller than most people think. And, you know, if you really get into a good real asset, piece of real estate, it, it works just the opposite way. You know, you can you can make a good return and then the government gives you a couple percent in in, in uh, depreciation. If you buy right in the right market, you get a couple points for appreciation. You get some interest right off. You get some tax advantages. You know, next thing you know, before you know it, your 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 seven or eight percent annualized return turns into a ten, twelve, fifteen percent return when you when you when you throw in all those different factors. So it, it's just you know, if if you're just if you just got your head down and you, and you're not paying attention, you know, you're not paying attention to the to the tax law or or some of those other factors, you, you're really going to be swimming upstream. So what kind of person, Dave, do you like to work with? What kind of investor? Is it somebody that just has the money or somebody that comes in with the knowledge? Uh, or is that one of your specialties is having the knowledge so that you can put them at ease? Well, I always like to lead with education. I mean, I, I think an educated investor is better than someone that just you know turns a blind eye and just has the money. I, I want an investor that's educated, that that knows what what's going on, that knows what we're doing. I I just just recently released my second quarter portfolio review. I sent out a newsletter that talks about every deal that we've syndicated, so the investors, every investor that that's ever invested with me, can see exactly, you know, how that property is doing, the the, the one that maybe they invested in, or the one that maybe they've passed over you know, two, three years ago, they can still every quarter, they can see, you know, what's going on with that property, keep kind of keep an eye on, on what's going on. And, and one of the reasons I do that is just to keep everybody educated, want to make sure that that they know what's going on. Um, I guess kind of the the investor that um, is kind of my niche is the investor who is a busy professional, a busy entrepreneur, a business owner, whose sole time and attention is focused on their business or career and they're making a lot of money, but they don't have, they're doing what they do best and they don't have time to go out and do the research and do the dirty work and set up their own team and, and all that. So I, that's kind of my avatar, kind of my niche of folks is, is that busy professional or busy business owner that has extra cash that wants a good return. And what do you find their fears are, or maybe some of the questions that you are asked before they, you know, write that check to? You know, it's it's really it's really different when you are dealing with an investor who you've done a few deals with, or an investor who finds you on a podcast. You know, yeah, that's even different than someone who's been referred by another investor who's maybe been investing with me for a long time. But a person coming in cold, they they should be um, skittish. You know, there's there's um, there are um, a lot of folks out there that are bent on uh, doing what's best for them and not what's best for the investor. And uh, so I, you know, just uh, just. Once you get past the part about, you know, having the investor being able to trust you and, you know, they get to, um, uh, you, and, and you as the syndicator get to the point where you can perform for them for a while. Uh, but, it, but at first it's, it's about trust. People do business with who they, people, people do business with people that they like and trust. 
So if you get them to the point where you perform for the way, I always say the best way to communicate with an investor is with a check. Mm-hmm. So if you can do what you say that, say that you're going to do and you deliver the real results, it won't be long until they're not asking so many questions and they just want to do more deals. And obviously they trust you to find those great deals and they're not necessarily all in this country, in the United States. Uh, share with us uh, some of the other things that you have going on outside the U.S. So I I very seldom do um, business with new people. Uh, as far as when I when I uh, create a team, uh, what I really like to do is I like to create a team and then do business with that team over and over again. Well, the team that introduced me to the Memphis market. Uh, they're a development team, and they um, had a development going on in Belize. So I really, when I went down to see the project, I went because I had a relationship with the developer. And I really liked this developer. We had done business before. And so I really invested, when I first started investing back in 2013 with this with this team in Belize, I was investing in the team. You know, I mean, you had a, we had a 67-acre parcel of dirt with mm-hmm. some canals built in, you know, and they were the, the uh, canals were dug into the dirt. So, you know, you kind of kind of had the the master plan, and it was, you know, they had it on paper. But to take that from dirt to a fully built out resort, I mean, you know, that's that's uh, development at any uh, place in the country is risky. Now, when you move that overseas, it even becomes, you know, riskier. So I was really investing in the team. Um, it really became obvious that um, I was right, um, you know, investing in the right team. Um, about a year ago, when Hilton uh, came to us and said, "We want to, we want a uh, brand new resort," and now we open on December the sixth as a Hilton resort, and it's just been a lot of fun seeing that go through that whole process. But it really comes back to the team. Uh, you know, the team attracted Hilton. The team attracted Coastal Living, which is part of the Time Time Magazine family. So you got two big, huge, giant marketing engines pointing at your project in Belize, and it's just it's just been a fun uh, fun ride, and it's a testament to the strength of the team and the quality of the project. Mm. Uh, tell me specifically about this area in Belize. So Belize, there's there's around 200 islands in Belize, and then of course you get the mainland. So where our project is is uh it's called mahogany bay village but uh we we actually just changed the name just really recently because hilton came in and and said well you you guys have one of the most beautiful beaches on the island so it's now mahogany bay beach um mahogany bay mahogany bay resort and beach club so um it's on Ambergris Key, little town, the main center of town on Ambergris Key is San Pedro. It's a mile, it's just over a mile south of, of the town center in San Pedro. And it is the number one uh, tourist attraction in all of Belize. So if you're going to Belize, 72% of the people that show up in Belize actually end up on Ambergris Key. Um, it is the, it was called the number one island in the world two years in a row by TripAdvisor. So we're just getting a lot of uh, positive press like that, and it's really put us on the map in the last couple of years, and we've been making new all-time highs in overnight, overnight tourism for the last six years. And it's just been fun to watch as, as the demand builds. The demand is building up, but the supply is nowhere near keeping up. So what does it look like uh, in Belize now? You've got the, the main building done and ready to open. What does it look like from an investment standpoint? Yeah, so phase one of the resort is we open. Um, phase one of the resort is uh, 205 individual homes, and they're, they're all going to be part of the Hilton program. So right now there's still the uh, opportunity in phase two Phase two isn't built yet, but there's still the opportunity in phase two to invest your capital. And we're projecting uh, a solid double digit return on stabilization. And, um, you know, you, you still got the opportunity to even have a, a really big capital gains play. I mean, and a really big appreciation play. Um, there's a couple of things going on that, that I think is very important that people, some people don't realize. And one is 
the opportunity to buy a lot for a fraction of the appraised value exists there for a couple different reasons. One is there's no financing in the marketplace yet. The other thing is the resort isn't open, so not a lot of people have seen it. And so there's this kind of price that you can buy in, in at today, and then there's a third-party appraised value, and, it, and it's it's uh, the difference there is uh, mind-boggling. It's it's you know almost uh, an 80 percent difference there, and we feel like that window of opportunity is going to close quickly. But the real opportunity, uh, you know, is is not only the appreciation part, but uh, especially it's the cash flow part. We we really think this is going to be a, a strong cash flow play uh, for an investor coming in. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of investing overseas as opposed to in the States? Let's back up to 2009. You can look at the real estate market in 2009 and what happened to us here in the United States. And then you look at uh, Ambergris Key Belize and what happened there. Um, instead of seeing a eight to ten percent increase every year, what happened in 2008, nine, and ten, it just kind of stabilized, but they didn't get a big drop. Maybe, maybe a, a small percent or two in real estate values, but very, very little. And it quickly rebounded in 2010, and it's been climbing ever since. So. That's one. I mean, just the diversification. And then, you know, some people may feel that investing overseas is, you know, risky and dangerous. I, I would argue that having all of your investments, all of your uh, business in one jurisdiction, in one currency, in one nation's currency, it, it just, uh, to me, that, that feels even more risky. So I think it's just, um, you know, you should do your due diligence. You should go down and, and check out the market. You should really do your homework and make sure that it that it's the right thing for you. But for me, it was uh, about the team first. It was about diversification. It was, uh, you know, it just made a lot of sense. Well, I'm sure it's beautiful down there and, you know, to get down there and check, check it all out and uh, see what you're investing in is uh, going to be very nice for some people to, you know, take that trip. And do you go down often? Do you take a team out there? What, how does that look? Well, yes, you're absolutely right. And, and, and the fact that it's absolutely beautiful is, is another reason it makes it pretty compelling. Uh, yes, my family goes down. I've got a wife and four kids. Uh, my family normally goes down in the wintertime for a couple weeks. Uh, we take a tutor with us. We have school right there at the resort. Uh, two years ago, it was nine weeks we were down over the winter. It gets really cold here in Pennsylvania, so it's not a not a tough call for me to to uh, move down there for a couple weeks over the winter time. But uh, yes, that that certainly helps. It's it's absolutely beautiful down there. So tell me, Dave, uh, a lesson that you learned earlier on in your investing career that still you know. Uh, helps you in the way that you do business today? You know, I early on, I invested with the wrong people. So when I keep talking over and over again on your show or with an investor about how important the team is, that wasn't something that I was born with. Mm. That was something that was painfully pounded into me. So uh, just you know, investing with the right people. I've I've had uh, experiences. This was back when I was only investing my own money, thankfully, and uh, got into some uh, got into some uh, bad deals. They looked really good on the outside, but it came down to the team not being able to perform and make those uh, make those assets perform. So, investing with with a, a really good team is is super important. And uh, share with us a story, maybe that you've been able to, you know, help somebody that you know didn't really have much idea what they wanted to do with their money. You know, you helped uh, lead them, guide them, and share with us the results they were able to achieve. Yeah, so I, I love the voicemails or the emails or the the notes that get sent to me. I, I love when I hear something like. You know, because of, of what you've taught me, I was able to take my tax liability from, you know, 25000 a 100000 whatever it is, down to almost zero. So helping people uh, 
get to my, I mean, it's one of the things that, that I tell an investor coming to me looking for advice or looking for a deal flow or, you know, I, I want to know about that investor. Everybody's, everybody's situation is different. So I don't want to cram somebody into an investment that needs funded on my side if it's not a good fit for them. I want to know about the investor. You know, if, if somebody's looking for strong appreciation and I put them into a cash flow play that doesn't have very good appreciation at all, you know, it, it, it's not, that's not uh, conducive to a good long-term relationship. And, and most of my deals now get funded, you know, 80%, 90% by existing investors, investors who've done business with me for a long time. So, you know, that's the kind of relationships I'm looking for. Uh, being able to help investors do do the right thing for them and forget about me. It's not about me. It's not about getting my deal funded. It's about them and, and getting them into a good deal and having a good, good experience for them. Because if you make them happy, they'll talk to their friends. They'll come back for more and it just sets you up for a, uh, for a successful career in syndication. Well, I appreciate you uh, chatting with us today. There's a lot of great information there, uh, Dave. And, you know, I'm sure there's people out there listening to this that are going to be looking for a place to invest their money and looking for somebody who is knowledgeable and have their best interest at heart. Uh, what is a good way for them to get in touch with you? The best way is to email me at info at therealassetinvestor.com. Info at therealassetinvestor.com. And, and by the way, if somebody emails me, if, if your listeners email in at that email address, I'd be happy to send them a, a, little, uh, copy, a little copy of a, of a booklet that I wrote up. It's a eight lessons for syndicators and their investors. I'd be happy to send them a copy of that. So if they reach out to me, uh, I will answer their emails, be happy to answer their questions, uh, give them some investment advice if I feel like I can help them, and also send them my little write-up on syndication. Excellent. That's a great little resource to get started and see if it's a good fit to work together. Uh, we've been listening to Dave Zook. For, uh, he is the founder and CEO of The Real Asset Investor. Dave, thanks very much for being a guest on the show. Thanks for having me, Neil. And to our audience, if you like what you hear, hit that like button and share, and we'll see you next time on the show. You've been listening to Business Authority Radio with Neil Howe and Greg Williams. To learn more about the resources mentioned in today's show or to listen to past episodes, visit businessauthorityradio.com.